If you'll join me, please, in Romans chapter 2, as we consider this epistle of Paul, verse by verse. And as you're turning there, uh, Father, I also like to pray. I'd ask that you pour out your Spirit upon us, and Holy Spirit, please come. Give us the gift of teaching, that we would understand what it is that you are saying to us. These words come from eternity, so they are the bread of life for every generation. Please feed us that bread this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so, yikes. In Romans, where we've been so far, you know, obviously we took a break last week because of Resurrection Sunday, but uh, in previous weeks, in Romans chapter 1, we, we looked at what God has revealed to mankind. And mankind is Jew and Gentile. And he's revealed himself. He's revealed his righteousness. And he's revealed the unrighteousness of man. And also, uh, he shared what he will reveal. And he will reveal his wrath against those who hold the truth. And the truth is a revelation of, of himself. Uh, that hold the truth in unrighteousness, which means unbelief. To not believe is unrighteous. And so every person has been given a revelation of God. Every person has a conscience, an awareness of God, a moral code. If you care to look back on the back wall there, there's a a banner that has gray and blue stars all over it. It says, kindness is out of this world. That's the truth. Because kind, kindness, is the nature of God, who is in eternity. We have kindness because it's part of the conscience that he's given to us. Uh, but the Lord has also revealed himself to every person in creation. The heavens declare his glory. Uh, the design, the intelligence behind everything speaks of a creator, and he's also revealed himself to man by his written word. Uh, And every person is accountable to him for the revelation that he's given to them. No more and no less. And so looking back on chapter 1, scanning it, if you will, starting verse 21, we read all sorts of of, of things that describe the day then when the Apostle Paul was inspired to record these words. They also speak to days in which we live now. Um, There's no difference between the people who do those things and those who, in verse 32, take pleasure in those who do them. Uh, Then in chapter 2, because that's true, because in chapter 2 we looked at the fact that there's no person that's qualified to judge another person. Uh, According to the spirit of the law of God, which Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, we are all forgiven murderers. And we are all forgiven adulterers or committers of, of sexual sin. And so our reaction to the sin we see around us should be that of the humble publican and not the self-righteous Pharisee in the parable that Jesus taught. Uh, We are to have the heart of our Father in heaven. We're to have the mind of Christ, which is to be grieved, not angered. God is not looking down on the world in anger because of all the the darkness and the sin that he sees. He's grieved. He's heartbroken. That's to be our heart as we see the sin. And where should we see the sin first? Uh, Within. Because it's there. That nature is still there. As well as all around us. We should be grieved by that. And we should be racing to embracing the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And for those who need his forgiveness, we should be seeking reconciliation Sinner to God and not condemnation. That's not a ministry we've been given. That's not why Jesus came. He did not come to condemn. He came to save. And so we who are forgiven sinners are not qualified to forgive, to judge rather unforgiven sinners. That belongs to God alone. And so when we stand in judgment of someone else, we are in fact taking something from God that does not belong to us. And we are out of line. 
So what are we qualified to do then? Well, we are qualified to to declare to unforgiven sinners the way to forgiveness and reconciliation, which is Jesus Christ. And the drawing card of God is love. He draws people unto himself by his love, not by his wrath. And so that's our heart. That's to be our heart with all those around us. So now as we move forward in Romans chapter 2 regarding sin and and sinners, God's way to forgiveness, God's way to reconciliation, uh, we're going to see that there's no difference. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. And we get a hint of that uh, in in the Old Testament. Remember the first worldwide judgment of God? That was when? The flood. Was there a separate ark for Jews and a separate ark for Gentiles? No, there was only one ark. Oh, and there weren't any Jews either. God had not yet created that nation to be his witnesses. One. One ark. Uh, it's the same now. So let's get our feet under us by backing up to verse 5 in Romans chapter 2, which says, But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, obedience, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he gives them eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, to them he gives indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So we are told clearly that God who is holy and God who is just is going to render every person individually according to their deeds. To those who obey, believe, he will give glory, honor, peace, and eternal life. To those who do not believe, do not obey, then he'll give indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish. Uh, To the Jew first. And then to the Gentile. And verse 12 says, as many as have sinned, whosoever does not obey the truth will be judged by God. As many as have sinned. Well, let's think about that. Sinned. What is sin? Missing the mark. That's what the word means. Missing the mark. Okay. Uh, What's the mark? Perfection. Perfection. So sin is anything less than perfection. Would all the perfect people please stand up? That's our problem. That is our problem. All have sinned. All have sinned. And what is the penalty for sin? Death. Ezekiel 18.4, the Lord says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. And what, what is death? Death is a separation of which there are two kinds. Physical death, separation of the eternal soul from this temporary body. And then the second death, eternal death, my eternal soul being separated from God forever. Uh, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God So for sinners, and that's everybody, right? For people who believe and obey the revelation of God given to them, God's righteous judgment for those sins and the penalty for those sins were borne by Jesus Christ on the cross. And by grace through faith, we are judged as Innocent of all wrongdoing, and we're given a gift, eternal life. Jew and Gentile, no difference. Now, 
For those who don't believe, do not obey, let's consider first the Gentiles. A Gentile is anything, anyone who's not a Jew. Uh, the Gentiles who were not given the law and do not believe or obey the revelation of God given to them are going to be judged guilty of sin. Sin is unbelief. To not believe what God has said. To not believe that God is. To not believe what God has said. To not believe what God has done for us. They will be judged uh, guilty of sin and sentenced to remain where they are, which is dead in their sin. Uh, Now, the Jew, on the other hand, who, in fact, was given the law, if they do not believe, if they do not obey the revelation of God given to them, which is far greater than the revelation given to your basic Gentile, uh, they'll be judged guilty of sin, which is still unbelief. To not obey is to not believe. Uh, they'll be judged by the law and they'll remain where they are, which is dead in their sin. Jew and Gentile, there is no difference. The difference certainly is the revelation of God given. Uh, The Jews were given a far greater revelation of God than were the Gentiles, but they're both accountable for the revelation they've been given. No more and no less. So, Why did God give the Jews the law? It wasn't given to them as his main, as his means of saving them from the penalty of sin, but rather to reveal to them the sin of all mankind. He created a people from a man, Abraham, who had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob, who had 12 sons and They went into Egypt as a family. They came out a nation. God created a nation for a purpose, to be his inheritance and to be his witness to all the nations of the world. He gave them the law to show them and mankind through them that everyone is guilty of sinning against God and therefore are worthy of death, worthy of separation, and they're in danger of a a holy and just judgment for all eternity. In Romans chapter 3, starting verse 19, which we'll get to perhaps next week, uh, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. I see my imperfection. I see my offense against my creator in his word. That's the point. Now, to them, he gave the law. What kind of obedience was expected? Well, let's see. To sin is to miss the mark, and the mark is perfection. So if I'm going to keep the law, it must be perfectly kept. James 2 tells us that for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, just one point, he is guilty of all. Obedience to the law. If we're going to stand before God based on our merit, Our obedience to his revelation must be perfect. No one will stand before him on that merit except Jesus Christ. Uh, In Galatians 3, verse 10, uh, we're told that for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And then Jesus added the spirit of the law. Adultery isn't just the physical act. It's having a lustful thought. Okay, so my, I must be perfect in every thought, in every deed, all day, every day, if I'm going to stand before God based on my performance, my merit. Uh, but that's not why the law was given. 
In Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. We cannot keep the law. Jesus kept it for us. And when we believe he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we are in Christ and we stand before God in him, his performance. Verse 13. Parenthetical thought here, verses 13, 14, and 15. Uh, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Uh, Speaking primarily to the Jews. So let's go to Leviticus 18. Before we bounce back. Leviticus 18. Hearers of the word are not declared innocent before God, but those who do it. Leviticus 18, starting verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. What did the Egyptians do? They worshiped false gods. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, Shall ye not do? Same problem. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So bouncing back then to Romans Chapter 2, verse 13, for, the, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Hearing the law, hearing the words of God being spoken in a synagogue or in a church does not make innocent a sinner. It makes him aware that he's a sinner and that he needs, above all things, the forgiveness of God. And in that state, hearing the words of God received by a a soft heart will lead a person to do the right thing. And the right thing is to repent, to repent from, turn from the sin and to take the measure of faith that God is putting into us and invest it in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Faith that's genuine, uh, not just spoken. Faith that's genuine is obedient to the Father in heaven, doing what God says. And the motive is love. Because God commanded his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we love him because he first loved us. We are obedient because we love our Father. Just like our children, not always obedient, but sometimes obedient. Sometimes they were obedient. (laughs) And I'd like to think because they loved us. (laughs) Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves which shew or declare the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. So verse 13, directed at the Jews. Verse 14 and 15, directed at Gentiles. They were not given the law, but they have a law. It's written on their hearts. The conscience, the awareness that God is, the moral code of God, which includes kindness. And so the Gentile instinctively knows that God is, which we covered in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. It says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, i.e. mankind, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
the Gentile instinctively knows that God is, which is the essence of table one of the law given to the Jews, right? The the Gentile instinctively know right from wrong. They know justice and injustice. And they know it's written in their conscience to honor their father and their mother, to not kill, to not commit adultery, to not steal, to not bear false witness, and to not covet. That's table two. Those things also written on the heart. And the sum of all that is love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's written on the hearts of the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles obey what the Creator has written on their hearts, then they're the doers of the law that they have received, and they are justified. Verse 16. We should read verse 12 and then verse 16 because 13, 14, 15 are parenthetical thoughts. So back to verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There is an appointed day of judgment. Now, we don't know when that is. Uh, for the individual, uh, we're told in Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. But then there's a great white throne judgment later. But on the appointed day of judgment, the one true, all-knowing, all-seeing God, who alone knows the secrets that are buried in the hearts of every person, He administers a heart exam for all mankind, one at a time. And the matter is a matter of the heart. When the prophet Samuel was told to go to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse because it was God's turn to choose a king, he got there and David, excuse me, Jesse presented his sons in birth order and starting with number one and and, and Samuel said, oh, this has got to be the one. Look at this kid. And the Lord spoke immediately to Samuel. He said, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. In a time of great rebellion, the Lord sent a prophet to Israel, Jeremiah, and he said in in chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? All right, as I... As every scripture is for me personally as in you personally, what is the Lord telling me about my heart? Apart from him, without the the presence of, of, of Jesus in my heart, what's he telling me about my heart? Constantly lying, deceitful, utterly wicked. And I can't even possibly know what's in there. Who can know it? He does. Next verse. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the veins, reins rather, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, David, David knew that. David is a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? Was David a sinner? Yes. Was he a forgiven sinner? Yes. Why? He believed and obeyed. Not perfectly granted, but he knew that he couldn't even look within his own heart and see what is there. And so in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, he would be inspired to write these words, Search me, O God, and know my heart. And and try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I will not find it by myself. I will wander off the cliff into darkness. Lead me into life everlasting. You are my shepherd. Help me to hear, to recognize your voice and to follow you. Our hearts are deceitful. God alone sees what's in there. See, we can fool each other. 
brothers can fool brothers and sisters can fool sisters and you want husbands can fool wives and wives can fool husbands. And we can even fool ourselves. But we cannot fool God. So this heart exam that he administers is not a religious sacrament that takes place in a confessional. Every Saturday afternoon, my mother would pile us into the station wagon and haul us down to the church. And we would take our turns walking into this creepy place. Behind a veil sat a creepy guy. And every Saturday afternoon, I lied to him. I made stuff up. Because you have to, to go there, you have to have sin. Could I see my sin? No, I was an angel. So I, I just had to make stuff up in order to do my penance. I lied to him every single Saturday because he didn't know Jack. He didn't know me from Adam. But that's not how it is anymore. I go to my father in heaven and I'm honest and transparent because he already knows. He knows how many hairs are on my head and he knows I'm from Adam. And so we are given a, a great opportunity when we fall short to confess our sins. And when we do, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A wonderful thing we have. But this, what's in view here in verse 16, uh, this heart exam is going to be administered by or through Jesus Christ. And this is sin being judged. The sin of the believer has been judged, not to be visited again. So this judgment in view is for those who do not believe, those who do not obey the revelation of God given to them. And it's going to be administered by, through Jesus Christ. He told the Jews in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethesda, for the son judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the son. He went on to say, whosoever receives the words that I speak and believes on the one who sent me shall pass from death to everlasting life. Which means, at this judgment, one person at a time, it's not going to be a consensus thing. It's not going to be this person compared to that person. It's going to be Jesus Christ compared to this person. This person compared to Jesus Christ. Don't ever want to go there. Don't want to go there. So, back to verse 16. In, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, is Paul saying the gospel is his? No, no, no. In, in Galatians, he already told us that he certified to them that the gospel that was preached was not of him, not after man, but it was a revelation of Jesus Christ to him. It's the gospel of God. It's the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace. It's called a number of different things, but that's the gospel that he's preaching. And basically, Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, and was buried and raised again the third day, according to the scripture. And by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Therefore, there is no difference when it comes to salvation, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to standing before him, pleasing and acceptable. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Both have sinned. Both have a written law of God. And both will be judged according to their doings. So now as we move forward, the Apostle Paul, remember, he's recording these words. He's inspired to write them. The author is the Holy Spirit. And he turns his attention to the Jew. And as we read our Bibles carefully and you read the personal pronouns, they're singular. He's not speaking to the Jew as a nation. He's speaking to the Jew as an individual. The, the personal pronouns are singular. Why? 
Because salvation is a singular personal event. It's not a national thing. It's personal. And this is written to the Jew, singular, who thinks there is, in fact, a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, which is a form of self-righteousness. Because after all, you know, we got the law. They don't. We're the chosen people. They're not. So with that heart set, we read in verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, thou. King James, it means you, singular. Because thou art called a Jew, and resteth, or rest, in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and provest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law, speaking to the individual, the singular personal pronouns. You who call yourself a Jew, you rest in the law. You're settled in the law of Moses. You think you're okay with Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because you have the law of Moses. What's unsaid, which I hear every time I read that verse, is uh, you don't believe that what the Gentiles call the New Testament is the word of God. You hold strictly to the law of Moses and you think you're okay with God because you have it. You boast of God. Hey, I'm one of God's chosen people. I'm of the seed of Abraham. So I'm okay with God because I'm Jewish. That was the heart of the Pharisee. You who know the will of God. How do they know the will of God? It's been revealed to them in the law and the prophets. And the law and prophets speak of whom, by the way? Jesus. You, are, you approve of, you're proud of the fact that you've been given a greater revelation of God than have the Gentiles. And you are confident, you are self-confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. Those poor Gentiles that worshiped idols, false gods. You are self-confident that you're a light for those in darkness. You have a moral superiority to the Gentile. You are self-confident that you're instructor to the foolish, teaching wisdom to those poor, ignorant Gentiles. And you're self-confident that you're a teacher of babes, more mature in spiritual matters, more knowledgeable of the things of God than the Gentiles. And you have, he concludes, you have a, a form, an outward appearance of the knowledge of the one true living God and of truth. But then he asks them heart-piercing questions of them. Verse 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a, a man should not steal, does thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? So God the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, is asking some penetrating questions to the, to the Jews. And, and they're his people. He's got a heart for them. He says, you, you teach others, but do you teach yourself? Are you listening? Are you receiving into your own heart the very things you're teaching? Or maybe are you a hearer of the word and not a doer and therefore deceiving yourself? You preach to the Gentile, do not steal, which is commandment number eight. Right? Written in stone by the finger of God. Commandment number eight, do not steal. You, you teach Gentile, do not steal, but do you steal? Either literally stealing something or coveting, which is commandment number 10. To covet something from someone else is to, in the spirit of the law, steal it. You say to the Gentile, uh, do not commit adultery, which is commandment number 7. But do you commit adultery? According to the spirit of the law, 
Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at someone and lust in your heart, done. You see, the Jew is no different than the Gentile. Uh, you abhor the idols of the Gentiles. But do you profane the Holy One of Israel uh, in your heart with the things of this world? The Jews no different than the Gentile. Uh, you boast in having the law of Moses, but do you dishonor God by breaking the law, by not keeping it, not obeying perfectly? You see, the Jew is no different than the Gentile. Jews are mankind. Gentiles are mankind. Mankind is dead in sin. Being Jewish does not give a person a get-out-of-jail-free card. Because there's only one get-out-of-jail-free card, and who has it? Jesus. He is the way, the life, and the truth. No man comes to the Father but by him. So the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Believes what? He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died for my sins, who was buried and rose again on the third day. Uh, by believing that to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And available to every Jew, available to every Gentile, is the power of God to be reconciled unto God, to be made a new creature. Second Corinthians five seventeen through 21, to be made a new creature, a new kind. By the power of God, we can be made a new kind transformed from mankind to Jesus kind. It's that simple. And there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. So those starting in verse 17, going down to 23, to those whom it is, is written, uh, being no different than the Gentiles, but thinking they are, uh, have caused the name of God to be blasphemed among the Gentiles, which God said it would be. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 5, it ends, My name continually every day is blasphemed by self-righteously misrepresenting God because there's a disconnect of the heart and by being no different than the Gentile in they're doing, which is unbelief and disobedience. The law, excuse me, the, the, the Jew has taken the name of the Lord their God in vain. That's written in stone. Do not take my name in vain. That's commandment number three. Verse 25. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? So, what is circumcision? First of all, not, it's God's sign. Don't go there. <laughs> it is God's sign of his everlasting covenant to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And it's, it's a physical representation of what's to be internal, the cutting away of the flesh, you will. So in, in verse 25, this physical circumcision, the, the sign of God's covenant with Abraham, who, by the way, in the same chapter was told that you will be the father of many nations, uh, circumcision is beneficial. It's to your advantage, provided you keep the law. And how must the law be kept? Perfectly. Otherwise, it's broken. Sin is missing the mark. Anything less than perfection is sin. Uh, so this, this circumcision, evidence, if you will, of being a physical descendant of Abraham uh, cannot save a Jew 
from the penalty of sin. In fact, it is sin that makes the physical circumcision worthless and meaningless. So he goes on to, you know, the Jew and the Gentile. Therefore, if the uncircumcision, that's now we're speaking of the Gentile. If the Gentile keep the righteousness of the law, what's the righteousness of the law? How is the law fulfilled? What is the fulfillment of the law? Love. Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. He kept it perfectly. But Romans 13.10, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus gave us the cliff notes. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On those two hang all the law and all the prophets. James referred to it as the royal law, to love your neighbor as yourself. So if the Gentile is, keeps the righteousness of the law, the, the love, shall not his physical uncircumcision be counted as obedience unto righteousness? Yes. In other words, the Gentile does not need to become a Jew and to come under the law to be saved, which is, was an issue in the early church. And he goes on to say, shall not the uncircumcision, the Gentile, who fulfills the law, and remember, it's love, that's the fulfillment of the law, shall he not judge you, the circumcision, the Jew, the unrighteous, who break the law? Isn't an obeying, believing Gentile going to judge a disobeying, unbelieving Jew? Uh, you think you're the judge, the judge of the Gentiles. It might be the other way around. It depends on your heart. Uh, the salvation from the penalty of sin is not a function of race or religion. It's a function of the heart. A heart that is broken before God and surrendered to the person and to the work of Jesus Christ. The Jew is no different than the Gentile. All are on even ground. Therefore, verse 28, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So you see, Jew and Gentile are mankind. And mankind is dead in sin, destined for eternal death. But God so loved the world, and it is God's will that none would be condemned, but all would come to repentance. It's God's will that all men be saved. And so every Jew, every Gentile is offered the opportunity to become Jesus kind, to pass from eternal death to eternal life, to be forgiven by grace through faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so God, who is the God of the living, as Jesus himself taught, uh, says that a Jew is not one that's outward, which is what's seen by man, is not one that's circumcised of the flesh. A Jew is one that is inward, where he alone sees. And circumcision is of the heart. The corporate reading this morning was in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Moses is preaching a sermon to the children of those who left Egypt who are going to go in and take the land. And he tells them to circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Circumcision is to be of the heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, the Lord said, And I, the Lord thy God, will, will circumcise thy heart. If we can't know our heart, how can we possibly circumcise it? We can't. So the Lord says, I, the Lord your God, will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou may live. Lord, I want to, I know that you are. 
I, I know I'm not perfect. I want to live. Change my heart. And he does. Circumcision of the heart. Uh, in this time of great rebellion against the Lord, Jeremiah said to them in chapter 4, verse 4, uh, circumcise therefore, excuse me, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Circumcision is of the heart. The God of the living says a Jew is one who is, it's an inward state, reconciled to me in Christ, and circumcision is of their heart, and alive by the Spirit, not by the letter of the law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, we are told that uh, the Apostle Paul is writing, the Lord has made him able, an able minister of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. If they're alive by the Spirit. And their praise is not of men, but of God. They don't boast before God or before men that they're Jews because they have the law. No, they are in Christ. A, a, a Jew in God's eyes are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, according as it is written, he that glorieth or boasts, let him boast in the Lord. There is, when it comes to salvation, being forgiven and being reconciled unto God, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. So what can we take away? What maybe should we take away from this passage of Scripture? Well, the, the, the verse that really I was focused on is verse 24, which says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as, is, is, as it is written. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the history of Israel is given to us as an example. Uh, that's part of their history. We need to learn from that. We who are believers in Jesus Christ, are new creatures. We're Jesus' kind. We're to relate with each other and to all others accordingly, with the mind of Christ and the heart of the Father. We're ambassadors of Christ. We're witnesses of the risen Lord. And we have a hope, a certainty, because God promised it and God can't lie. So we have a hope, and that hope is resurrection from the dead unto eternal life. And so, for some number of days, none of us know how many number, the number of days we've been appointed, uh, we've been given a message. And the message is love. That's the heart of the gospel. And we've been given a ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. To cry to those who have not believed, as someone cried to us when we did not believe, be ye reconciled to God. Uh, and so when I look at verse 24, then uh, what, what comes to mind is 2 Corinthians 13, 5, where we're told to examine ourselves, whether we're in the flesh, and to prove our own selves. Can that verse be spoken about me? Is the way I'm living causing an unbeliever to blaspheme the name of my Lord? Jesus said in Luke 6, 4, 646, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Can that be said of me? In, in Luke 11, verse 35, Jesus warned those listening to him, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness. He is light. If he's not there, it's darkness. If I'm striving to stand before God based on my own merit, my light is darkness. You know, 
do I think I'm okay with God because I go to church? Am I okay with God because I was raised in a Christian family? Am I okay with God because I'm a good person compared to some of these clowns around me? (laughs) Well, we need to remember. We are forgiven, but we have not arrived. The Lord has begun a good work in us, but he hasn't finished it. Otherwise, why would we be here? We're works in progress still. And so we need to think soberly. And we should not think more highly of ourselves than we should. Uh, We, in this world, we carry the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there is no salvation in any other name. That's the name we carry. And so we must be always mindful. You know, it must be in the forefront of our mind. Always. That what I do and what I say is seen and heard by the all-knowing, all-seeing God. And that unbelievers are watching. See, you're no different than me. This Jesus thing ain't real. Uh, That's verse 24 coming like a ton of bricks. Uh, our, Our walk with God, our walk with Jesus doesn't fool anybody, except maybe us. We can fool ourselves. Now, our walk is either genuine, granted, it's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect this side of eternity. But our walk with the Lord is either genuine or it's a facade behind which there is no substance. And people can see it. And, of course, God sees it. And we have to be very careful to not self-righteously misrepresent the Lord Jesus Christ by having a disconnect of the heart. We need the heart of the Father. Uh, We can't think of ourselves as different than the unbeliever because, but by the grace of God, there go I. We have to be very mindful about taking in vain the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that simply calls for unconditional surrender every day throughout the day to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. And we need help. Do we not? Otherwise, why would the Lord say, I send you a helper? We need help. Uh, And so we should be quick very quick, to ask for the power of God from on high to help us right now. Talking to this person, going there or going there, doing this or doing that. Oh, help me. I need help. See, if, if, you're, a, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, then you have a personal relationship with the Father in heaven. How do we cultivate that relationship? Obedience, time and effort. Every relationship takes time and effort. We have a a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we cultivate it? Obedience. We need a personal relationship with God the Holy Spirit. Do we have one? Or is he just on the periphery? Is he any less God than the Father or the Son? No. No. What part of God do you not want? We need a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit who guides us to all truth, who brings into our remembrance the things that Jesus said. So if you don't have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, ask for it and receive it by faith. And if you have one, cultivate it by obedience. Everywhere we go, where's the Holy Spirit? Everywhere. Talking with the Lord is no different than having a conversation with your spouse or your child that you're walking with. When you're alone, you're never alone. The Spirit of God is always there. Now, if you're not a believer, and I don't know who's watching on Facebook, and I don't know when you're going to watch. I don't know the circumstances of your life. uh, But if you have not bent your knee and confessed with your tongue that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, You need above everything 
the forgiveness of God and to be reconciled to him. You need a personal relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus. Call upon his name. Receive the gift of eternal life. That's why we're here. That's why we were created. Amen? I if you'd stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation that you've given to us. You have given us a conscience, an awareness that you are. You've given us a moral code. You've given us the witness of an amazing, breathtaking creation. But we're mostly thankful for the revelation that you've given to us in your word. And Jesus is the word. And he was made flesh and he dwelt amongst us. And he came to reconcile sinners unto you. To pay the penalty for the sins of the world. That whosoever would believe would receive the power to become your children. That's your desire. That's your heart. Thank you for, in our own way, in our own times, speaking those truths into our hearts and taking us to the foot of the cross where we called upon the name of the Lord to receive the gift of salvation. And we pray for those who are listening who have not so done, but perhaps are feeling a tug in their heart. That's the witness of the living God speaking to you, that these things be true and inviting you to also call upon the name of the Lord and to receive his gift of eternal life. Thank you for this amazing work. We ask that you would uh, fill us with your spirit that we might be a part of what you're doing in the places you planted us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.